Everybody, if you could take your seats. We have a very unique keynote in that it comes second in the day. I have Scott Myers here up on stage. Uh, and what's also unique is that he's actually not doing um, software programming on a day-to-day -day basis, but that gives him a perspective that's a little bit more holistic. He's able to step back and have a view about some of the things that might matter to people who are dealing with software programming on their daily basis. So with that, I give the stage to you, Scott. Thank you very much. I want to start by remarking that what Vladimir did was unbelievable. Imagine your boss comes into you and goes, oh, by the way, that demo that's scheduled for an hour from now, it has to occur immediately in front of about 100 people. Can you do that? And Vladimir said, yeah, I, I, I could do that. So that was amazing. So thank you very much for doing that. We were trying to solve some technical little problems with my presentation. Um, other than the fact that the fonts didn't work, the font effects didn't work, the transitions didn't work, and it wasn't formatted correctly, really there were no issues that had to be dealt with. Three years ago, I was invited to speak to the D community, where I tried to convince them that the last thing D needs is somebody like me. Here I am again. <laughs> so, I want to talk about things that I think matter for software development. Lots of things matter. These are not the only things that matter, and I can't guarantee that if you do these kinds of things, it will give you success in your software development. But I think it increases the likelihood, and anytime we're talking about things that matter, there's two things you need to know. The first one is, matters to who? Matters to me. So you're getting my opinion. And the second thing is, well, what is my background? Why should you even care about this stuff? So let me talk about my life. So this is my life with computers. So I was a user starting in 1970. I was a programmer starting in 1971. I went to a very progressive school. They decided that now that this kid has programmed for one year, let's make him teach the other kids. Here's a hint, do not have a 13-year-old boy teaching other 13-year-old boys. Really bad idea. I also did some research in computer science um, as a graduate student. You'll notice that there's a gap there sort of in the 70s, and I was thinking, what was I doing then? I mean, I wasn't working with computers. What was I doing? And I thought about it, and the only thing that came to mind was, well, I did have my first kiss about that time. <laughs> and then I thought, well, did that lead to anything? <laughs> and the answer was no, so I went back to computers. That's what I like, geeks clapping for geeks, excellent, so. <laughs> As you may know, I have a dark past, so let's get it right out into the open. <laughs> In fact, if they awarded 25-year medals for being involved with the dark side, I would actually have it. And we know that dark clouds occasionally bring some unpleasant things. This definitely colors the way that I look at things. It's important to keep that in mind during the presentation. So, first thing that matters, efficiency and speed. They are not the same thing. I realize that they are not the same thing. In some cases, you can maximize for efficiency in one area, and it actually decreases speed, but the two of them tend to go together, and so I'm going to lump them together, because my experience over decades is that if you don't keep your eye on the ball as regards efficiency and as regards execution speed, there's going to be some problems. What I find frustrating is the reputation in many software circles that speed and efficiency has as it's something that gets tacked on later. So what I've given here is a list of what I think are different kinds of programming areas where speed makes a difference or efficiency makes a difference, but for different reasons. Embedded systems, for example, it tends to be important because if you can make your embedded systems more efficient, then that means it can run on lower quality hardware, and if you're producing millions and millions of um, devices, then paying less for the hardware for each device makes a difference. Mobile devices, we want to maximize battery life. So the sooner something is finished being computed, the sooner the machine can go to sleep, that extends battery life. There are a series of kinds of software that I call foundational, 
which simply means that you build other kinds of software on top of it. That includes things like system software, libraries, and servers. If those things aren't fast, the systems that are built on top of them can't be fast either. So they become an enabling technology or a limiting technology for other kinds of things. And then there's my favorite kind of software. These are systems that can literally never be fast enough. So servers, for example, can't be fast enough because if you can make them faster and faster, giant server farms can be smaller. That runs, um, it doesn't use as much electricity, saves money for whatever company is doing it. So that's an example of something that cannot run fast enough. Things like simulations, video games, virtual reality systems, all those kinds of software, the faster they run, that means the more detailed the simulation, the more immersive the world you can build, the higher the frame rate you can create. They simply cannot run fast enough. And interactive systems. This is very interesting. What we know from empirical behavior is that small changes in interactivity affects user behavior. So for example, this is a quote from Amazon that points out that they would delay things by a tenth of a second and it led to substantial drops in revenue. Now maybe you don't care about substantial drops in revenue, but what you should care about is the fact that tiny differences in latency are clearly affecting user behavior. Not only do users notice it, it changes what they do. There was similar data from Google. They found out that if they slowed things down by a half a second, that led to a 20% drop in searches. That's giant amounts of money for Google. Again, small changes in latency affect people's behavior. And a lot of this work has been done in the web area, <coughs> which is why all my comments are coming from web development, but essentially the evidence indicates that a website speed correlates directly to its success. So speed is important for financial reasons, for business reasons, and it affects user behavior. So I would think it would be a slam dunk that we're not going to have to worry about people assigning a priority to speed. So how many people have heard the quote, premature optimization is the root of all evil? Okay, how many people believe it's a true quote from Donald Knuth? How many people have actually seen the quote? Okay, there's a few. So it actually comes from this paper, Structuring Programming with Go-To Statements. It's from 1974. And in case you don't believe it, there it is. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. As if to hammer home the point, look at the preceding sentence, which says, we should forget about small efficiencies, say, 97% of, of the time. So it sounds like Donald Knuth is telling us, wow, most of the time, you don't need to worry about efficiency. It is, after all, the root of all evil. So let me talk a little bit about Donald Knuth. How many people are familiar with Donald Knuth? Almost everybody. Excellent. Those of you who are not, you should be familiar with Donald Knuth. He wrote The Art of Computer Programming, which effectively codified the entire field of computer science before computer science was even a field. When he saw that his books were not being published acceptably um, nicely, he essentially invented the field of computer typesetting with tech and with Metafont. He also won the Turing Award, which essentially is the Nobel Prize for computer science. So I want to talk a little bit about Donald Knuth, only because most people don't realize that aside from being a genius, he's very, very funny. So this is the paper, Structured Program with Go-To Statements, and you'll notice here that he has some quotes at the beginning. Notice that one of the quotes is by Bob Dylan, That'd be Nobel Prize winner, Bob Dylan. <laughs> and the other one is, do you suffer from painful elimination? Which presumably was an advertising slogan for constipation or something like that. <laughs> you don't find that combination at the top of most technical papers. <laughs> so Donald Knuth tells us that premature optimization is the root of all evil. But we know from experience as software developers that it's typically not trivial to take a program that's running too slowly or not efficiently enough and turn it into one that is running faster or is running efficiently enough. Certain kinds of problems are architectural. They're at the design level. So for example, if you have a single-threaded program and you go, gee, I guess I'll make it multi-threaded, that is not a one-hour operation. If you have a system which was never designed to be distributed across multiple servers, 
was not designed for load balancing, any of that kind of stuff. And you decide you want to add all of that from scratch. Again, not a one hour operation. The operative word here actually is that premature optimization is the root of all evil. That if you do it too soon, that's a problem. But in some cases, you have to start right at the beginning. And in my experience, most important systems, you do have to address efficiency right at the beginning of the design cycle. If we go to that same paper by Knuth, there's another quote which gets a lot less airplay. He's talking about a particular kind of optimization that he's doing in the form of a, of a compiler optimization. And what he says is, ignoring efficiency in the small is an overreaction to abuses by some programmers. And then he goes on to say a 12% improvement easily obtained is never considered marginal. How many people are familiar with this quote? A few. What's interesting is it's on the same page of the paper. So bottom of the first column, easily obtained improvements are never considered marginal. Two paragraphs later, premature optimization is the root of all evil. But let's remember the sentence that precedes that premature optimization is the root of all evil. That's the one that says we should forget about small efficiencies. What he's essentially saying is, if you're dealing with something in the noise, you don't want to deal with that right away, because the payoff of investing time and energy is very small. But if you are just walking through your code base, and you notice the opportunity for a notable improvement, say 10 or 12%, of course you reach down, you pick it up, and you run with it. You don't just leave it sitting there saying, oh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. What you do is you instead look at the other quote. And that's the one that says that a 12% improvement easily obtained is never considered marginal. Easily obtained. That's the key thing. How much work do we have to invest in order to get the improvement? Let us suppose I have a couple of matrices. And what I want to do, for whatever reason, is, add the, uh, is sum up the values of all the matrix elements. I can do a column major traversal, which is where I walk down every column in that matrix one by one, add them all up, it gives me the sum. I can do a row major traversal, exactly the same thing, except I go row by row. They do exactly the same amount of work. They touch exactly the same amount of memory, exactly the same number of times. In a beautiful, abstract, perfect world of computer science, they run at exactly the same speed. The code for implementing a column major and a row major traversal is almost identical. Switching from one to the other is clearly something which is easily doable. The problem is that they don't run anywhere near the same speed. The column major traversal is extremely slow compared to the row major traversal. So if you are coding, and you happen to write things as the column major traversal, you have just implemented something which is substantially less efficient than it could have been with a trivial change to the source code. But the only way you can take advantage of this is by knowing that a column major traversal is substantially slower than a row major traversal. And of course, the problem here is that the people who are doing the hardware don't know anything about computer science. So you know they actually have to make stuff work. The definition of being able to easily obtain an optimization is knowing about it. If you know about a data structure, if you know about an algorithm, for example, you are in a position to say, oh, I can use this here. It's easy for me to do. If you don't know about those things, you are unlikely to be able to take advantage of them. This is a knowledge is power argument. So what you should do is first, Learn the capabilities of whatever libraries are available to you on a regular basis. Start with the D standard library, and then go on to whatever other libraries you use. There are people who have devoted decades of their lives to making those library facilities run as quickly as possible. You don't have to know everything they know. You have to know what they're giving you. Similarly, learn about algorithms and data structures. If you know about an algorithm and a data structure, it's an easily obtained optimization. If you don't, it's not. And learn about hardware, learn about networking characteristics, because at the end of the day, your software is going to be running on hardware. And that's why you have to worry about things like caching effects, which is what I showed you before. 
as well as network effects, latency issues. All of that stuff is going to make a big difference in terms of how easily you can obtain performance improvements. And I want to make one more remark about efficiency, which is even if you're not dealing with efficiency on a daily basis yourself, perhaps that's not part of your job, my experience over the course of many decades is that there tends to be a pendulum in the community that swings back and forth between efficiency and productivity. When we live in a relatively static world, hardware's not changing very much, programming languages aren't changing very much, algorithms are not being improved very much, it's a relatively static world, then we tend to optimize what we've got, and the business world says, let's start squeezing more improvements out of our software developers, we want higher productivity. And that leads to productivity-based languages, productivity-based interfaces in general. When the world is changing, new architectures are coming out, new software designs are coming out, new programming languages are being developed. Lots of things are changing. Under those conditions, typically efficiency is what becomes really important. So, if you are not in a position now where you have to worry a lot about efficiency or productivity, it is highly likely that at some point in your career, you will have to worry about efficiency because the pendulum's gonna swing back. So one of the things that I have learned over decades is that efficiency and speed simply matters. That's the first thing I want to mention. Next thing I want to talk about is portability, and there's lots of kinds of portability. The ones that I want to talk about, portability across processors, across operating systems, sometimes across compilers, sometimes across devices. There are two basic reasons why you care about portability. The first one is, you know, which means you know starting a project, you are ultimately going to have to have it run in multiple execution environments. It's a part of the constraints at the beginning. It's going to have to run. So you write portable code because you have to. The second reason is because you never know. <laughs> One of the advantages of being in this industry for a long time is you begin to encounter the same kinds of problems over and over. So, for example, I worked one time with a company, they do machine vision. They write, well, they have their own hardware, they have their own operating system, they have their own compiler. So, they said, we do not need to write portable anything. Own compiler, own operating system, own hardware. And that worked fine for many years. The problem was that stock hardware got faster and faster so that the advantage that they had with their custom hardware was still present, but was not as viable from a business point of view. And an awful lot of their customers said, hmm, we would be happy to take a 20% cut in performance in order to get an 80% cut in how much money we are paying, and that's the, uh, the option your competitors are giving us. And suddenly, this entire company, which had never thought about portability at all, found that they had to take a product which was never designed to run any place except in their own execution environment, and they had to make it run on standard compilers, on standard operating systems, running on standard hardware. It was an extremely expensive lesson for that company to learn, and this kind of thing happens repeatedly. Sometimes you need to move because the business demands it. So 2005, Apple announced that they were moving all of their Mac OS stuff from PowerPC to the Intel architecture because they looked at what was coming down the road in terms of stuff available for Motorola, and they said, it runs too hot, it doesn't give us enough performance, and it's not scaling up as quickly as the stuff from Intel. So they had to port that operating system from one kind of hardware to another kind of hardware, which they did quite successfully, by the way. But that was, they probably originally had never thought about porting. Sometimes you have a product that is so successful that pretty soon you've saturated all the available customers. Maybe you wrote something for iOS and you've now sold it to everybody under iOS. Well, there's still some Android people out there. Maybe you'd like to sell it to them. Or maybe it was on Windows and now you want to sell it to Apple because they've got a higher market share than they used to. And suddenly, what you would thought was originally going to be a single platform software development becomes a multiple platform software development. Or possibly you have to change compilers. Often, if you're moving to a different operating system or a different architecture, you will find you have to go to a different uh, compiler. Maybe less true in the D community, but the more success D has, 
the more incentive there's going to be for other entities to create decompilers that take advantage of particular execution environments. Now, when people talk about architectures for portability, almost always you get to see some slide that looks kind of like this. You say, take the platform-dependent stuff and put it in one place, and take the platform-independent stuff and put it someplace else, and then have some kind of compatibility layer in between. And of course, what you want to do is minimize the size of the platform-dependent stuff and maximize the size of the platform-independent stuff. Probably you've all seen pictures like this. Pictures like this are great. The problem is, in order to put together this in reality, you have to be able to distinguish the platform-dependent stuff from the platform-independent stuff. And that's something that not everybody can do off the top of their head, because there are a surprisingly large number of things that are platform-dependent when you might not think about it. So for example, obviously hardware characteristics vary from processor to processor, things like the word size, the cache dependencies, that kind of stuff. Operating system details vary. So for example, how long is an int or a long? Now, in D, you know the answer to that. But if you get outside the D environment and you start talking to operating systems, suddenly Unix says an int on a 64-bit machine is 64 bits in size. Windows says an int on exactly the same hardware is 32 bits in size. If you find that you have to interface with a C or a C++ API, you're going to have to deal with the fact that you are no longer in your nice, comfortable D environment where everything is nailed down and there's a certain degree of variability which has to be dealt with. But you have to know that that variability exists so that you can put it in the platform-dependent part of your system rather than the platform-independent part. I already mentioned C and C++, the details there, including wacky things like whether a char is signed or not. When you move from one compiler to another compiler, you are also often moving from one implementation of a standard library to a different implementation of a standard library. Or if you move from one platform and you're using something like maybe pthreads to another environment using pthreads there, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. That's actually a platform dependent thing. API availability can vary from platform to platform. The quality of the implementation of the APIs varies from platform to platform. The capabilities of the physical device that you're working on vary from platform to platform. All of these things affect what goes into the platform-dependent part of your system, and what I can suggest is let experience be your guide to find all the things that really do vary from platform to platform. The best experience that guides you is not yours. Take advantage of other people's experience. You don't want to have to spend as much time as they did. Which brings us right back to never stop learning, which is exactly what I told you about keeping track of things like algorithms and data structures. There's going to be a theme running through this presentation. One of the challenges that has to be addressed if you are separating the platform independent stuff from the platform dependent stuff is how do you, in a portable manner, get access to features that only exist on certain platforms? If you're running on multiple platforms, you want to take advantage of whatever special features they have. But you're trying to do it in a way that is sort of platform independent. Sometimes there's special hardware instructions you want to take advantage of. Maybe there's a GPU on the system, maybe there's not a GPU on the system. Maybe there's a specific API on an operating system which is available on one platform, not on the other. And then there's things like end user features. Maybe there's a fingerprint sensor, maybe there's not. Maybe there's a color display. Actually, maybe there's a display. <laughs> I have to say I'm increasingly intrigued by the new kinds of devices coming out which have no display at all. So Amazon Echo, Google Home. I just think it's kind of cool that we have these devices now which have no way to display any kind of information. And how do you deal with that in a, in a uh, platform independent manner? Maybe you got a camera in your device, maybe you don't. Maybe it's got two cameras, maybe it's an infrared camera, maybe it's not. There has to be some mechanism for allowing you to get that information. Um, even things like CD... How many people remember what a CD player is? <laughs> no. I mean, no, normally we're sort of thinking, what about these cool new features coming out? But actually, in some cases, we want to know about the cool old features and getting access to those kinds of things. So I don't have any brilliant words of wisdom about how you are going to deal with these kinds of problems or with this homogen excuse me, heterogeneity. But what I can say is, you're not going to be able to make that beautiful diagram of 
platform independent stuff here and platform dependent stuff over here unless you are able to identify what is platform dependent and what is platform independent and unless you are able to come up with an appropriate mechanism for saying from my platform independent code how can I get access to platform dependent features. So that's what I have to say about portability. And the next thing I want to talk about is what I call tool ability. This is a direct outgrowth of my experience with C++. And I want to talk a little bit about refactoring, because I learned what I believe is an important lesson. So 1991, first PhD thesis on refactoring comes out. Can't have one PhD thesis without having another PhD thesis. So 1992, different thesis on object-oriented refactoring. And in 1999, Martin Fowler's book comes out called Refactoring. For purposes of this discussion, that was what really popularized the idea of refactoring among many people in the programming community. So I'm just going to arbitrarily say 1999, when Martin Fowler's book came out, that is t equals zero. And what I'm interested in is how much time did it take for tools for performing refactorings to become available? So I love this. 1996, for the programming language self, which I don't have a lot of experience with. It manages to get a refactoring tool at T minus three, three years before Martin Fowler's book. Small talk, almost as good, two years before Martin Fowler's book. Java. So Java, about two years after Martin Fowler's book, there's a couple of tools, and Eclipse comes out four years later, there's another tool. So Java developers getting some nice support for refactoring. C Sharp, they have to wait another year or so, but then ReSharper comes out. How many people know exactly where this is going? <laughs> 2009, someone posts to Stack Overflow. Does anybody know of a refactoring tool for C++ that works? <laughs> That's 10 years. There is an update to this Stack Overflow post by the author. They update it. 2015, six <laughs> years later. Six years later. The answer to the question is still no. So t equals, delta t is 16 years. Um, that was, at this point, my understanding is there are a couple of refactoring tools for C++ that work pretty well, but order of magnitude longer wait than other programming languages. Now, for those of you who have been spared C++, uh, I just want to say, consider f of x. I say f of x, and what I want to know is, um, what is f? So I look at the source code, I see f of x, what is f? And for those of you who are familiar with C++, you know, you're know, you going to be knowing what's coming. The rest of you hold on to your hats. So it could be a function, or a function pointer, or a function reference. Or it could be a class that overloads the function call operator. It might not be a function at all. Or it could be an object that implicitly can be converted to any of those things. It could be an overloaded function name at multiple scopes. It could be the name of one or more templates at multiple scopes. It could be the name of one or more template specializations, which are treated differently from regular templates, by the way. It can be several of the above simultaneously. Overloaded function name, overloaded template name, name of template specialization. One of the simplest possible refactorings is rename method. Take a function, give it a different name, which means you also have to update every possible place where it's being, excuse me, every place it's being called. Not every possible place, every place where it is being called, which means you need to know what the heck F is there. Walter, did you want to say something? <laughs> Walter, would you please say that louder so everyone hears it? It could be a macro, too. By the way, that's still not an exhaustive list. The important thing I'm trying to get across here is it's really hard. There's a reason why after 16 years, it's still hard to get good refactoring tools for C++. 
you have to be able to answer all of these questions to do something as simple as rename a function. Which leads to the question, why are we having so much trouble? Or not you, but why is the C++ community having so much trouble? There were a couple of important decisions made. The first one was it was going to be compatible with C, which led to a certain amount of complexity regardless of what you do. And the second thing was that, frankly, the standardization committee doesn't really care. They will dispute that. And if you go and speak to individual members of the standardization committee, they will say, no, I care a lot about complexity, and they will be telling the truth. They do care. But if you look at the result of the work that they do, just by looking at the results of standardization of C++, you must conclude, I must conclude, and it's my talk, you must conclude that they just don't care. And what's interesting about this is that this is what Fred Brooks calls accidental complexity. There's nothing essential about the kinds of issues that C++ people are dealing with. It's all based on arbitrary human decisions that simply made things really complicated. So the result, however, is that creating a C++ analysis tool is almost impossible. Number one, for individual developers, it is almost impossible to write their own tool. People talk about writing a parser. Parsing is about 10% of the problem. It's the semantic analysis that really makes it complicated. So parsing is the easy part. But it also means it's impractical for third parties. So even if you want to pay money to someone to buy a tool, it is such a gargantuan task to do it that almost nobody offers those kinds of tools, which is why C++ developers wait 16 years for simple refactoring tools. In the case of C++, I will simply remark that there was this exacerbating factor, which is that there was already an open source compiler which did all this stuff. GCC does this stuff. But number one, GCC has the GPL, and a lot of tool vendors didn't want to have to be under that license. And number two, from what I've heard from talking with several people, it is impenetrable how that source code works. May have been cleaned up a little bit by now. The lesson that I take away from this is not about C++. The lesson I take away about this is that when you create something, whether it's a programming language, whether it is a data format, something that other people are going to be working with, either it is easy to write tools for it or it's not. If you have an artifact that is not easily toolable, what that means is that your users are going to be restricted in what they can accomplish themselves. It means that it is also going to constrain what outside tool vendors are going to be able to do for them. And what this means is that when users want some behavior, they're going to push hard against the only people who can give it to them. So it's going to be things uh, you're going to end up talking to, for example, you're going to go to Walter and say, Walter, could you please implement the following feature? I can't do it myself. And Walter's going to say no. <laughs> Walter should say no. With any luck, it's not that hard to write tools for D. But the important thing is it puts pressure on you if you are writing something, if you're coming up with a data format, if you're coming up with a programming language format, any of this kind of stuff. If it's difficult for other people to write tools, they're going to ask you to do that work for them. If you have artifacts which are inherently easy to parse or analyze, other people, I mean, you're programmers, this is what you do, you will happily write your own tools. And if it's hard to parse and hard to analyze, but there's also an easy to use API, then you'll use the easy to use API. But the important thing is when you are producing some kind of artifact that other people might reasonably want to build tools around, you should aspire to making it easy for people to build tools around that. It's going to be in the benefit of your user community. It's also going to be in the benefit of yourself because people will be asking you to do less work for them. Next thing, consistency. Everybody is in favor of consistency. Everyone's in favor of consistency. Consistency is the basis of abstraction. I can abstract away the details and still do something useful. Consistency is the basis of inferential reasoning. I know how this works, therefore I know how this other thing is going to work or I can reasonably predict. When you do not have consistency, 
you effectively are putting speed bumps in front of people trying to get things done. Now, I have two confessions. I guess three if you count the kiss. So, confession number one, I have an iPhone. Confession number two, I find it really hard to use. It's got this reputation of being this unbelievably simple device. And I tried to figure out, why am I having so much trouble with my iPhone? And I said, I'm going to narrow it down to something really simple. How do I delete something? How complicated can it be? So, well, here we have the Notes app. We've got a trash can in the lower left-hand corner in orange. Here we have the Mail app. We have a blue trash can in the middle. Here we have the Photos app. It's a blue trash can on the right, unless you're in landscape mode, in which case now it's on the top. Not a big deal. Except I looked at this and I went, what? Wait! This is the same app. Now, I am not a mathematician, <laughs> but I would like someone by the end of the day, please tell me, if you have four icons that can be placed in arbitrary orders, what are the chances that you will get none of them in the same place? <laughs> none of them! I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say, it's not harder to make them be in the same order. But look, it doesn't matter. It isn't always a trash can. Sometimes it's a red rectangle that says remove. Sometimes it says delete. It says trash with a trash can. <laughs> all the software that I am showing you ships natively with iOS. It all came from the same company. It came from a company with a reputation for extremely easy to use designs. So how come I have to keep programming, excuse me, I have to keep posting to Stack Overflow to ask how to delete something? I don't, I don't understand. Okay, so let's suppose you want to delete multiple contacts. So here in the Messages app, no problem. You check off the ones you want to delete, you click on Delete, straightforward. Let's suppose you want to do it in FaceTime. Well, in portrait mode, you are able to check off the ones you want, and then you hit delete, but you can't do it in landscape mode because it's not supported in landscape mode. And maybe you want to get rid of multiple contacts from your contacts app. No, you do not. <laughs> not in portrait mode, not in landscape mode, because the function is simply not supported in the contacts app. All right. Let's get past me and my difficulties using phones. So this is part of the C API. We've got three functions in the C API. They take a file pointer as the first parameter. Straightforward, nice and consistent. Here is another part of the C API. It has file pointers as the last parameter. I have talked to people who've been programming in C for decades. They tell me they still have to look it up every single time. They simply can't remember which one is which. And the comment has been made that this has been frustrating developers for more than 30 years. Now, if you are so lucky, if you are so fortunate as to be in a position to define an API or an interface of any kind that is still going to be used by people 30 or 40 years from now, do you want to be remembered for how frustrating your interface is and how inconsistent it is? Or would you prefer that maybe they focus on something else? Java, you want to know how many elements are in a container? No problem. We'll give you three different ways to do it. The people at Microsoft said, that's stupid. We don't want to have three ways to do the same thing. We will have two ways to do the same thing. <laughs> <coughs> Because you know two is smaller than three, <laughs> better. When I talk to people about this who work in the Java community or work in the, in the, the, uh, the Visual Studio community, they tell me it's not a big deal. I've got the, uh, the, the, the fancy integrated development environment, and it solves this problem for me. And I go, uh-huh, and what do you do when you're writing code that does reflection? And they go, yeah, well, you program in C++. So it doesn't solve the problem. This happens to me about once a year. I know, because whenever it happens, I send mail to somebody expressing my frustration, so I check my mail. I go to a website. I create an account. I give it a password. 
it says confirm your password. I type in my password. It goes, good job, you can type. Then it tells me I have to go to the login page and I have to log in with my new password. I go to the login page, I type in, I paste in exactly the same password I pasted in before. I didn't mistype it, it's the same freaking sequence of characters. I'm told the password is incorrect, which means the password is not equal to the password. How many people have had this experience happen? How many people think this is mind-numbingly stupid? So this is consistency of a different type. I've actually looked into this, and from what I can tell by poking around the edges and sort of being a programmer and trying this and trying that, uh, what they do is when you type in the password originally, they don't truncate it, and then when you enter it later, they do truncate it silently. So the password won't, so it'll work sometimes, but not all the time. This is unbelievably frustrating. And think about how much time probably gets wasted by customer service representatives, the crack team of tech support specialists, trying to explain to people why this doesn't work correctly. And it's because things are not being treated consistently. Next thing I want to talk about are interfaces. An interface is a way to accomplish something. A user interface allows me as a user to do something I want to do. An API is an interface that, as a programmer, allows me to do something that I want to do. So let's suppose my goal is to get to the top of that mountain. That's, the, that's what I want to do. I need to get to the top of that mountain. And for a long time, as a user and as a developer, I thought, sweet, I am going to climb that mountain. The harder, the better. That shows how smart I am. That shows how I can overcome obstacles because when I am done, I will have accomplished my task. Now, I knew that there were other people in the world. They didn't want to have to climb up. They wanted to go up the easy way. And when they got to the top, they wanted it to be nice and comfortable. They didn't want to have to have worked very hard. In my life, from about 1971 to about 2000, I was all about meeting the challenge and proving that I am, in fact, a manly man who got kissed once. <laughs> I really wanted to prove that I could get... I didn't care how inconsistent it was, I didn't care how slow it was, I was going to show that I could do it. And I had no sympathy for the people like, oh, it's too complicated. I was like, get a life. About 2000, I got a life, and suddenly I wanted to be the guy in the gondola going up. My perspective shifted. I wanted to get something done. I did not want to have to prove that I could figure it out. I just wanted it to be easy so I could get my job done and move on to other things. My experience is that many people working in software development, which is an inherently complicated task, it's very detail-oriented, they're not as sympathetic as they might be to people who don't want to climb the mountain by hand. So what I want to tell you is that for interfaces, you should shoot for them to be easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. That's what your goal should be. Even if you like hard interfaces, tough. Suck it up and give them good interfaces. You should be able to assume that the people using your interfaces, whether they are user interfaces or APIs, they are smart people, they are motivated, they have some experience with software, they want to succeed. Very few people pick up software and say, you know, I think I'm going to fail. I'm in a failing mood right now. <laughs> they want to get something done. They want the API call to work. They want the user interface command to do what's appropriate to do. So, if you have users, they're smart, they're motivated, they're experienced, they want to succeed. And if they fail using your interface, it's your fault. It's not their fault. They brought everything that they could reasonably have been expected to bring. Your goal should be that interfaces are easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly, which means if an action is possible, it should almost always do what is expected. And this takes us right back to consistency. 
If an action is unlikely to do what it's expected, it generally should be impossible. In user interfaces, we sort of know what that means. In APIs, it means if you pass a sequence of parameters which probably are not going to do the right thing, get the type system to reject it. Use the type system to encourage people to write calls which are almost certainly going to work. You should be aspiring to what Rico Mariani calls the pit of success. The pit of success is someone's using the interface and they accidentally trip over, they fall into it, oops, it does the right thing. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to work, but, but it, it did. That's the sign of a really good interface, was people are succeeding without even thinking very much about it. And in particular, what I really want to discourage is something I hear a lot, which is, eh, they'll figure it out. This is what I find to be a common um, response when I point out inconsistency or other kind of things that are considered cosmetic issues, little issues. Eh, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out is a way of saying, I'm too lazy to do it properly. It's not their job to figure it out. It's your job to make it so that they don't have to figure it out. Interfaces should be easy to use correctly, hard to use incorrectly. And they matter. And the last thing I want to talk about is commitment. There are probably zero people in this room who say, I believe software should be inefficient, should not be portable, should be difficult to use, should have a lousy interface, and should be inconsistent. That's what I'm for. Probably everybody here, every day you go to work, you agree in concept with the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. So the question is, how can I show you so many examples from so many platforms of things which do not adhere to the kinds of concepts that we're talking about. And I think a lot of it has to do with what I call insistence versus compromise. Everybody in this room has a disadvantage. The disadvantage is you are adults. You know how the world works. There's the perfect world. There's the world we live in. You go into meetings and, you know, you're ready to make some compromises because you can't have everything. And that is how we start violating all the kinds of things I'm talking about. <laughs> if you want to think about insistence, you want to think about a small child. They know how to insist on things. None of this compromise nonsense, I want this. Well, Scott, you can't have that. I want this. Now, little Scotty. <laughs> this is a good stage. I'm liking this stage. Sometimes you have to make compromises. I understand that. That really is the way the world works. But what I find is many people walk in and they start their negotiations with, gee, let's compromise. Whereas if they said, no, I'm going to hold out and not compromise until it has been demonstrated that there is no reasonable way I can achieve all of my goals simultaneously. I want to encourage you to employ a greedy algorithm for software quality. Demand everything and don't make compromises unless it's demonstrated that it just can't be satisfied. And that's probably not going to happen in a two-minute meeting or a 15-minute stand-up meeting. Some things are hard, but they do have solutions. Second thing I want to mention is just because every single person in here does a perfect job, just because every one of the teams that you are part of does a perfect job, things are consistent, things are portable, things are efficient, all those things we've talked about, even if that's true, if you then take your work and combine it with the work of other people and other groups and bring it together, there is no guarantee that the result is going to be globally optimal. If one team is optimizing for memory efficiency and another team is optimizing for runtime speed, you bring them together and it's not going to be as fast as possible and it's going to use too much memory. If one team has one set of consistency guidelines, another team has a different set of consistency guidelines, the result will not be consistent. Which means, if you want to end up with a globally optimized system, it is everybody's responsibility. It is not your job to only do the little piece you've been told to do. 
It's everybody's job to look at the entire system and see how are all the pieces fitting together, even if it's not in your job description. Because presumably everybody does have the same goal. It's to deliver the highest quality software pro product that you possibly can. But you can't do that if everybody's only focusing on their own individual little piece. It is a global optimization problem, and you can't solve that by having a whole bunch of local maxima and then sticking them together. So when I'm talking about commitment, I'm talking about having this global view of achieving the goals that everybody agrees we want to have. And I'm talking about insisting on achieving that global optimization, if at all possible. So the things that I think matter, efficiency and speed matters, pretty much regardless of what you're working on. Portability matters. Toolability matters. Consistency matters. Interfaces matter. And commitment to these other things matters. And I think that if you embrace these ideas and really try to put them into effect as much as you possibly can, it will move us all forward toward a day when we have better software than we do now. Thank you very much. I figure I'll be back in three years, so. so. We got time for a couple quick questions, if people have them. That's more of a comment. So the probability that none of the icons we need will end up in the same place is 3 divided by 8. I'm sorry? Uh, the probability that none of the icons will end up in the same place is 3 divided by 8. <laughs> I still didn't understand it. I'm sorry. So it's about the iPhone. Oh, OK. So about the photo app. Oh, yeah. The four icons. Oh, the probability oh, oh yeah. What is the probability? That none of them will end up in the same place is 3 divided by 8. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> The trip to Berlin was worth it. OK. <laughs> One question. Um, the global inhibitor to all the quality of uh, you're talking about is, I guess, money. Because business will do compromises to save money and to move on. And it's not the goal to get the best solution. It's the goal to get the cheapest solution that we can sell. Um, and I disagree with you. Um, I, first, money is an important consideration. It's an important constraint. But not everything costs money. So if I can go back here, um, I don't believe it would have cost Apple any more money to get those two things in the same order. That doesn't cost any, it doesn't take any more development time. All it takes is for there to be a concern. I mean, the very first person who tested this app should have noticed this. It's the same app in landscape and portrait mode. So. Money is a constraining factor, and in some cases, it is true that doing something less well costs less money. I'm on board with that. However, I think too many people use that as a get-out-of-jail-free card. And so, again, this goes back to insistence. If somebody says, look, this is going to cost more than that, well, if that's true, okay, now we're going to have to look for a different solution that doesn't cost any more. But I will remark that Getting something done well at the beginning is vastly less expensive than trying to retrofit it and fix it later. So I think a lot of, this, a, a lot of these things, not everything, but a lot of these things could be addressed during design and implementation, and it would not cost any more. But if you think how this could happen, normally it's consistent in the beginning because someone is lazy. They will not change the order of the icons. And then someone goes and only looks at the project mode, tests it, and says, no, the icons have to be in a different order. And then nobody cares about the landscape mode. So it's just forgotten because time was not there to test it. And that's completely. one explanation. Another expl I, th the explanation I would say is there's a problem with your process. If in landscape mode and in portrait mode, the icon order is allowed to somehow not be the same. So I, I would say fix your process, and, your, and then you won't have to incur any additional costs. Would you comment on the um, tensions, the cultural questions created to some extent um, by, on the one hand, the desire to create decomposable APIs that do sort of different things versus ensuring what you call commitment, uh, 
global coherence that people think about the imp implications of what they do for the whole the whole thing. Um, on sorry. the one hand, we want to break things up. On the one hand, we want to break things up into decomposable APIs. On the other, there is actually a link between different parts, which often tends to be, um, as a result of this decomposition, Oh, okay, so, so, uh, so you're asking, it, it sounds like a, a, a question about tension between two different kinds of API design? No, the very fact that you break things up into decomposable parts tends to encourage people not to care about the whole. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So you're saying that a focus on making things um, done well locally decreases people's likelihood to, to look at the global effect? Yes, because we, you know, the design seems to be broken up into things that don't depend on each other. But not just from a programming perspective, but organizationally, that tends okay. to lead to people not caring. Um, it's not my job, right? I so. don't think that that tension is inherent. I think, I mean, that may be the way that it sometimes works out in practice, but I think that if people are, you can break things down into smaller pieces and at the, still at the same time care about how people are breaking things down um, in different parts of the system. I, I agree, it's completely cultural, so. Well, you, you had a slide in which you, here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you had a slide in which it was shown that until the year 2000, you were climbing the mountain, and after that, you were taking the gondola. Mm -hmm. And I'm, more, I'm curious if uh, that switch happened uh, because of your overall experience or was it more a personal thing? In which case, uh, I don't expect an answer. Um, it's actually funny you should ask that question here because it's Andre's fault. If I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get to the picture, and oh, it doesn't matter. So, so the question is, what happened in 2000 that got me from somebody who wanted to climb mountains to somebody who just wanted to take the gondola up? Um, and it, it actually is Andre's fault. Do you remember this, Andre? So Andre, um, I, 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 I had written some stuff about, um, doesn't, I'd written stuff about smart pointers. And so Andre sent me um, some message. He said, you know, um, what you haven't shown is how to overload the member dereferencing operator. Operator arrow star, for those of you keeping track at home. And I thought, well, that's a really good point. We haven't actually done that. And so it turned out to be possible and complicated. And by the time I was done, I thought, my god, that's an awful lot of work to do this really conceptually simple kind of thing. Um, so it, it was actually during the time I was working on that particular problem, I said, I used to really enjoy solving these kinds of puzzles, and I just don't enjoy it as much as I used to. So I actually thank Andre for, for helping me get into the gondola, because I think it's, an important, it's important for um, having sympathy for a lot of other people who don't want to climb mountains by hand. So it, it was an important transition for me. It looks like there are a lot of questions, so I'm going to um, move on my gut and allow all those questions to happen, and we'll push the next talk a little bit into lunch. If anybody has an issue with that, maybe scream or shout, but otherwise I want to allow a couple more questions if that's okay with everybody. See, right now Vladimir's thinking, sure, the next person gets more time. <laughs> um, you, you've given uh, rant talks like this before, and some of them were very entertaining, like your uh, keyhole one. And I've sent suggestions to companies with similar things, and they never fix anything. Does it, do any of these companies ever fix any of the ridiculously obvious problems that you discover and you publicize? A lot of the a lot of the things that I'm talking about are conclusions that company came to on their own. So, for example, all the stuff I talked about portability, I have worked with many companies that had to make the transition from not worrying about portability to working about portability. I have dealt with many companies who've had to go from a philosophy of we'll tack on efficiency later to we'll um, add efficiency you know, early on in the, in the design cycle. I've talked to a lot of companies who've had to deal with um, we had to make our interfaces easier to use because our customers kept getting confused and it cost us a lot of money and support costs. So. I'm not going to claim that I go and I give a talk like this and they go, gosh, you're right, Scott, we should fix things. That's not the purpose of the talk. The talk is more to say, I've spent a lot of time 
dealing with software companies who've had issues to deal with, and the kinds of things that I'm talking about are, for the most part, things that have been discovered repeatedly by companies, and so I am encouraging you to learn from their mistakes and to get past all the making those mistakes and focus on making new mistakes. We have a question from the chat, uh, from the stream. Mm -hmm. um, Mark SC47 says, don't these goals often conflict? Example, uh, efficiency versus portability. Uh, and the answer is yes. These kinds of things will often conflict. Um, however, my experience is that people tend to say, oh, well, these two things inherently conflict, therefore we're going to let one or the other go. That's part of compromise. So I think that when you find two things that do conflict, then what you need to try to figure out is, is there some way to resolve both of them so that they don't conflict any longer? So um, this is going to take me back to commitment, which is that before simply saying, oh, wait, uh, as, as an example, sometimes efficiency and portability conflict with one another. But not always. There's, there's a whole lot of examples of things that run much, much faster on all platforms that we've ever cared to run it on. For example, if you switch from one data structure to another data structure, often that will be a win across the board. So my concern with that kind of question, it's a legitimate question, but what I would say is before concluding that these two things are inherently in tension, try taking a different look at the problem and saying, all right, can we find some new way of doing it that will not, uh, for example, that will be more efficient on all the platforms that we care about? Um, yeah, I found your uh, talk was very inspirational and was uh, quite uh, interesting that you would uh, have this uh, insistency of being uh, insistent to get the best possible result. The problem with uh, global optimization is that it is an unsolvable, uh, an undecidable problem in the general case. It is actually classified as a problem that you cannot solve. It's in the same space as the holding problem. Okay. And uh, j just because we are here at DConf, D has uh, some problems with uh, some design things that you uh, talked about, like refactoring and, p and portability and stuff is uh, heavily, uh, it's heavily constrained by the very useful uh, language features that mm -hmm. we do not want to give up. And the, uh, I, for example, I work a lot on uh, improving those. And the problem there is that at some point the improvement gets so hard to do and it takes so much time then that, that nobody can reasonably uh, justify getting a better solution and they just hack around it. Okay. Um, there are constraints that have to be dealt with and um, for example you talked about uh, building tools for D and, and because there are these useful language features and stuff. Um, let me just give an example of something which actually did happen in the C++ community. So C++ is no less complicated now than it used to be. But people are writing tools to do analysis for C++ now, which they were not doing a few years ago. And the reason that they are doing them is because of LLVM and the Clang compiler, which is open source and which has a reasonable license and which is something which people can actually work with. And so essentially somebody, somebody did the unbelievably large amount of work to build a nice usable API on top of C++, and now people can use that API to shield themselves from the complexity. So in some cases, uh, you, know, you said there are theoretical limitations to what we can accomplish, and in some cases there are theoretical limitations. For example, uh, refactoring bumps into the, the whole thing problem right away, because you're trying to prove that two programs do the same thing. But that, in my view, is not an excuse for stopping. It's to say, okay, maybe we can't solve the problem in its full generality. Instead, let's chop off um, a restricted part of the problem that's maybe 80% of it, and let's solve that. Because that at least moves us forward. So I am sensitive to the idea that you can't solve everything. I am sensitive to the idea that large systems get very, very complicated, and it becomes very difficult to keep them in sync. 
I don't accept that that's an excuse for not trying. So what I'm trying to get across is to embrace these principles as much as is practical and to not abandon them unless there's really good reason to do that. That's the basic message I'm, I'm trying to get across. I guess I'm going to do the template improvement then. <laughs> we have time for one last question. So I, I have a comment about efficiency and portability and many of the other things uh, you've talked about regarding the question. So a, a lot of these things should be tackled by changing your obstructions. So if you rethink your obstructions and how your software is built, in many cases, you can get both portability and efficiency and actually, the thing we like about D the most is then, then you don't have to pay for these abstractions because D gives you great tools to optimize all of these away. And basically, that's the reason we are here, and I think many of the other people are here, is that this is an environment that lets you get everything, and you don't have to pay for it. Very nice. I think that's a good comment to end on, considering the conference. So. Um, I will be here for the rest of the day, so if you want to track me down and talk about stuff, um, I welcome the opportunity to talk with you. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Scott. We'll start again at 25 after with a warning that we'll go probably about 15 minutes into lunch. So, thanks everybody and see you back shortly. <laughs>